welcome you all to the PTO Presidency Council candidate forum today. I would first like to thank our candidates for your willingness to serve, and then also thank all of you for coming out today to learn more about our community members that are running for this office. For those of you who are not familiar with PTO Presidents Council, each school in Barrington 220 has a parent teacher organization, which is a volunteer, not for profit, nonpartisan organization whose ultimate goal is to enhance the student experience by strengthening the link between home and school. We encourage open communication and foster parent involvement. In years of contested school board elections, like this one, PTO Presidents Council has traditionally hosted the state time forum so voters can acquaint themselves with the candidates running for these positions, which is critically important to our community and also to, also to our youth. Um, all candidates officially listed on the ballot have been invited to the forum, and we are pleased to announce that all five are attending today, which is excellent, and you get to hear from all of them. We've been soliciting questions from the general public over the last couple <coughs> weeks. From the questions submitted, we selected questions that focused on issues and ideas. In addition, we do have readers here today with index cards, and you can see something in the back, and they also have pens. Um, so if you have a question for a candidate, you can submit it, please write them on the index cards, and then, and you can always ask, you know, raise your hand if you would like someone to bring you an index card if you didn't receive one yet, or a question comes up in a minute, in the middle. Um, if you pass your card to the aisle, or you raise your card, then a runner will come by and pick it up. Please keep in mind that these questions need to be asked to two candidates. So you can specify a candidate, you can specify two, or we will select a second candidate to answer that question with them. Our goal is today's forum, for our forum today is to last approximately two hours. Now, with further, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Christina Anderson Cook. Christina is an attorney, small business owner, uh, and legal recruiter. She earned her law degree from Northwestern Law and previously served as a federal prosecutor and as a law firm partner in Chicago. Christina is mom to a BHS student who also attended Prairie and Countryside. Uh, and she has been involved in local issues, including education, environment, zoning, and gun safety. As part of her job, Christina interviews hundreds of job candidates every year and really enjoys the process of getting to know candidates through questions and answers. So I'd like to welcome Christina, and thank you so much for being here today. Let me know if you can't hear me, is this okay? Is it working? Okay. Um, well, I wanted to thank Lori very much, and also the PTO President's Council. They put a ton of work into this event. This is how I decide who to vote for most years. I get a tremendous amount of information from this, and I hope it's really helpful to you all as well. Um, I know we all want to be well informed when we go to the polls on April 2nd, and we do encourage your friends and family to get out and vote. We all know how important it is who's going to be overseeing our schools. Um, to the candidates, thank you again, and I'm going to move it right along so we can stay on the time. You've all received the forum guidelines, and we're going to ask you to follow them to keep this conversation productive and civil. I'm not worried that we're going to have any unpleasantness. This is Barrington, not Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> we do ask you to direct your comments to the audience rather than to each other. And I do apologize now if I have to stop you when you're running out of time answering the question, but we have to keep on this for the Board of Education. We have, uh, in alphabetical order today, Barry Altshuler, Eva Cole, Matthew Gray, Leah Pollister Lazari and Angela Wilcox. And we will now begin with personal statements. Each candidate has had a chance to prepare a statement. Um, it's about 90 seconds long. And we're going to go ahead and start this round going alphabetically down the line. And then going forward, we'll skip around a little bit so that different people have a chance to go first. Do you need the microphone? Um, you would you like to, let's see. Is it already on? Let's try. Let's see yeah. how that goes. <coughs> Hi, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Barry Altshuler and I'm running for school board 220. I've been a resident of the Barrington area for 32 years. I am a local pediatrician. And I've been a pediatrician for 32 years. I care for kids. I care about kids. I'm an advocate for kids. Uh, also, because I've run this business, I have experience with personnel, with budgets. I'm the father of five children who all graduated from the Barrington schools. Uh, in my opinion, they're all very successful now. And I attribute a lot of their success to the phenomenal education, the quality, well-rounded education they got in the Barrington schools. I've had a lot of local experience through the board and uh, other organizations. I've been on the Enrollment Monitoring Committee. I've been on the Response to Intervention Committee, the parent uh, connection to that. I've been on the Health Committee. That was formed about 10 years ago when there were a, a rash of suicides in the area. Um, I'm also currently on the board of the McHenry County Head Start 
I've been for uh, seven years, I've uh, since retired, uh, Barrington Youth and Family Services, uh, as well as on BASA um, and Fine Arts Boosters. I want to give back to the community. I am passionate about public education. Uh, schools drive the property values in the area here. I think it's important to ensure that there's academic quality and that we address social emotional needs of the, of the students. I want a safe school, I want an inclusive environment, and I want to lower toxic stress on the kids. I will be a good steward of your tax dollars. There are two uh, board members who are retiring and they're gonna be very hard to replace. And I feel very confident that I'll be able to be one of those if you choose to elect me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Eva Cole and um, I have lived in this district all of my life. I have two children who have graduated from Barrington High School and have attended the school here. I'm a senior financial analyst by trade and I've worked for Fortune 500 companies. Um, I also have a lot of background in uh, financial planning and uh, also budgeting and analysis. So I feel a lot of these uh, skills that I have would be a very good asset to um, the Barrington School D District 220 and being able to help in cost savings, cost analysis, and being able to look at and manage your budget as best as possible. I'm also an advocate for children. I have a son who has ADHD and I have had special needs in the school district. And so I'm very passionate about that. I, I'm very passionate about having, helping those kids to fit in and to be able to get through the school district and be successful when they get out. So I hope that with this I, um, opportunity that I'd be able to help out in the school district wherever I can fit in. Thank you. Do I have to use this? All right, my name is Matthew Gray. <clears throat> Hopefully, you guys can all hear that. Um, I'm married to Kimberly Gray, who's in the audience as well. I have three daughters. Um, my wife went to school here, grew up here. My oldest daughter is going into middle school next year. My youngest is going into kindergarten next year. Um, I'm very passionate about the community. I think we are very lucky and blessed to live in a great community like this. And I also believe the, the, the school is the center of that community. And it really provides the competitive advantage of this uh, community to other communities around here. Um, that's, you know, that's really why I want, want to be an opportunity to give back, strengthen that, strengthen that position that we have in the community. Um, the skills that I have is, I've, the last 20 years I've, uh, I've built a business from scratch. Um, I've dealt with business processes, uh, creating accountability um, and you know, decisions. You know, so really it's about this process of over time, uh, building a decision-making you know, decision group and advisory committee that really runs a business. Um, the other thing that's really uh, allowed me is to see an insight into the future skills of the, uh, the, the people and the future of the, the talent that we need and really how education needs to really support um, the new the new skills that are um, coming to the labor force. Um, it's really a technology driven business. The skill sets have really trained from an extroverted, like you know, aggressive uh, speak up, uh, you know, kind of a doer methodology to a uh, a creator method. You know, a creator environment. They're really artists, and creativity is really very important for uh, the skills of the of the future. So I really see is a lot of the 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 uh, important aspects of the future learning environments, Sorry, et cetera. Wrap up. Okay, well, that's it. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> see where I'm going with it. <laughs> All right, how does this work? It doesn't sound like oh, it's, it's, it's not on. There we go. All right, how's that? Is that good? All right, so I just want to thank the PTO presidents for hosting this. This is a wonderful event. It's great to see so many people in our community coming out to try and get involved and know what's going on in our schools. and making it an educated choice of who they want to vote for, who's going to represent them. I want to thank our moderator, Christina, and our introductory uh, PTO president, Lori, for, um, for being here and hosting today. My name is Leah Callister lazari uh, I'm an active volunteer and parent of students in the school district. I really care. Um, I've had the opportunity to have students at five schools. My oldest, Araceli, is off to college in Boulder, Colorado, University of Colorado. My middle child, Fiona, is already a senior at the high school. And my, my baby, Paul, is already is a freshman. So um, I had the opportunity to have a student at Lyons, Countryside, North Barrington Station in the high school. 
So no, I didn't move three times. They were in the dual language program, but it gives me a unique view. Um, I'm also an attorney, a real estate broker, I have a family business, I've been on a different board, the time is ticking here, I talk too much. Um, so I have experience on boards. I stand for fiscal responsibility, paying attention to taxpayer dollars in a responsible way, school safety, which everyone's gonna talk about, and I'm concerned about school stress. Great schools strengthen our communities, and I think it's really important. Thank you. So yeah, I would never cuss up on my head. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Angela Wilcox. I am running for my second term uh, with Barrington District 220. I have two children in the district. Uh, they are both at Station Middle School, so it is really super fun at the Wilcox House right now. Um, I have, uh, my husband is a uh, local doctor, and we've lived in the area for 15 years. Um, my day job is an intellectual property attorney. I've been a partner at a firm downtown for about 20 years. And starting uh, the beginning of this year, I uh, made the move to open my own firm, which has been uh, both terrifying and exhilarating at the same time. In honor of Women's History Month, I should mention that we employ all females currently. Um, I'm also a taxi driver sometimes, so if any of you have a play date or a sporting <laughs> event to get to, I'm sure I'm already headed there if you need a ride. Um, I volunteer for a host of uh, Barrington charities and organizations. Internationally, I'm on the board of a company that is publicly traded on the India Stock Exchange. I seek re-election because I love volunteering for the Board of Education. I find this to be such a rewarding use of my time. I put a very high value on public education. My father was a public education teacher for 34 years. And as a uh, member of the Board of Education, I think I have a very strong history of being very fiscally responsible while always making decisions that have the um, social and emotional and educational needs of children at the forefront. Thanks. Thank you. In this round, we will start with Barry. Um, and the question is as follows. What do you believe to be the responsibilities of a school board member? What, if any, professional experience do you have with governance or education? that helps qualify you to be on the Barrington 220 School Board. What qualities do you personally possess that you think will benefit the community, the school board, and Barrington 220? I know that's a long question, but have at it for two minutes. <laughs> school board member represents the whole community. He or she is one who must work on a team. You don't have individual uh, uh, parochial interests, we really are looking to represent the whole community. Uh, our job is to work with and supervise the superintendent and his or her administration, in this case, his administration. Um, and we want to ensure a quality education. That includes academics, that includes the environment that our students are in, uh, staffing, um, and safety, which we'll probably talk about more later. But you know that's all part of the school board's uh, uh, job. We certainly want to continue the great work that our current school board is doing uh, in terms of balancing budgets and uh, maintaining a good fund balance and keeping a, a, a good, strong bond policy uh, or, or a, a AAA bond rating, I should say. Um, so what I can bring to this is um, certainly my experience as a pediatrician and advocating for kids, um, but I'm a good listener. I'm very open-minded. Um, I do not have an agenda other than that I want to continue the excellent education that, that we provide here. Um, and I'm uh, hoping that that being part of the group of, uh, of seven, that I can be a good contributor and continue the great work that the board is doing. Thank you very much. We'll just go down the line. Um, I am an advocate for schools and for students, and I'm hoping that with my background in finance and accounting and budgeting, I've worked for Fortune 500 companies, as I mentioned before, and handled millions and billions of dollars in uh, budgeting. And so I'm hoping that with that experience, I'll be able to bring that to bear for the school district to be able to balance the budget, be able to find cost savings where, where um, it's available or appropriate. And also you know, looking at and helping the schools be able to be really good forward-thinking educators and then allowing our students to be very successful in the school districts no matter what challenges they face. Thank you. 
Um, I mean, the job of a, a school board, someone on the school board really is to, you know, listen, ask questions, and try to make, you know, data-driven changes for the future in the right direction. And a lot of that is you get, you have to work together as a team, create priorities of what you want out of the school district, and really focus, like, everything has to be about that goal that you're trying to achieve. Uh, and you have to make sure you're asking the right questions to get to that goal. Um, I don't have any particular experience in the educational world, but that's really no different of like the process of uh, running a business. So uh, I have a business that is on many metrics as big, if not bigger, than the Barrington 220 uh, district. Um, and I, but I think that a lot of those questions that you ask are very similar in the nature. So that's what I can offer. Hello. All right, there we go. There we go. Um, I think Barry did a great job of summarizing what the duties of a school board member are. Um, I'm happy to say that getting to know this group up here, I think we have like team players. I don't think we have uh, issues like that of any of the people running, which is great. Um, what can I bring to the table for the school board? Um, well, right now, as a, as a parent of students in many schools and having been involved for years, I feel like I can hit the ground running. I'm paying attention to what the issues are. I've been involved with the Blueprint Committee of Citizens. Before that, I was paying attention to the start time issues. Um, I've kind of been advocating for students and teachers and programs for a few years, for a lot of years now, if you ask some of my friends. Um, as an attorney, I've got that background to contribute for teacher negotiations. They are the backbone of our school. We need to keep excellent teachers. Um, as a real estate broker, I've got experience. My pulse is on the market nationally, what's going on in real estate. This referendum, that's gonna be a big part of what this board is doing if it passes. If it doesn't, we'll be having to solve that problem as well. Um, I've been on a board before. Um, I'm involved with uh, Lutheran Church Terry's. It's a much smaller budget than the school board, but they're nationally recognized. You may be familiar with the Comfort Dogs. Um, so I know how a board works. There's cycles, there's budgeting, there's staffing, there's planning. It's going on all the time and you're looking towards the future all the time. Um, I really care about this and I'm ready to jump in and volunteer and give back to our community. Great schools are going to strengthen our community. So the role of a school board member is to provide governance for the district. And when I first joined the school board, I, we went to a ISBA, um, I think it was a two-day uh, symposium, discussing what is your role as a school board member. And it was described to at least the group when I went through as this. There's a dance floor, and that is where the day-to-day -day activities are happening at the school. And you, your goal is to be up in the balcony watching the dance floor. So you're to provide governance, policy, hire a superintendent, monitor the superintendent's performance, um, maintain a balanced budget, but it's not to get on the dance floor. So uh, in my opinion, that is what a, a good school board member does. Uh, as far as maintaining uh, you know, the policies, when I first joined the board, I was appointed to be on the policy committee, which I thought was awesome because I was able to really dive in. What better way to learn all about a school district as a new school board member than to be on the policy committee. And our policy committee was tasked with moving all of our policies from one form of communication, which was kind of a PDF format where people would you know, scroll through and look for their issues, to an online format where it was searchable. And myself and Sandra Bradford served on this policy committee and still are on it four years later, where we reviewed every single policy of the district. So as far as uh, feeling that I have um, an understanding of the governance of the school board, I do. Um, with regard to specific, specific character traits, I'm collaborative and respectful. I think if you've had the opportunity to watch any of our riveting board meetings, you'll see that we do not always vote 7-0, which I think is extremely healthy. I don't think a board should walk in lockstep. Uh, I'm unbiased. I've made many opinions that make my, or I, I've cast many votes that have made my children gasp because of the impact on them. And finally, I'm an attorney as well, and I do think that it does provide an ability to um, discuss, sometimes argue, and always provide a good uh, opportunity to, to write, uh, which is an advantage for our board as well. Thanks. Thank you all. The Bible you is the ballot. Do you support the referendum that will be on the April 2nd ballot? Why or why not? If it does not pass, what do you feel would be the appropriate course of action 
for the Board of Education to take in the aftermath of that? Um, I do support the referendum. I mean, I have, I mean, it's true, you have a half a billion dollars worth of uh, uh, real estate out there. I mean, a, a simple figure for most real estate is probably a 5% maintenance factor. I mean, you know, so that's coming to $25 million a year that really you should be putting into a, a real estate based asset. I mean, we're putting at this point, it sounds like, you know, two and a half million uh, on, on, a, on an annual basis and then fixing and really putting band-aids over uh, a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of the uh, investment that's out there. Uh, so in that regard, I do support it. I do support some of the other initiatives around that with the future-based learning. Um, I'm a big believer in the environmental aspects of the, the, the kids that need to build the, um, the skills for tomorrow. It's a, just a different type of environment that is really needed, and I, I think I have a, a direct experience to, uh, to that. Um, what was the second part of uh, um, the second part of it is if, if it doesn't pass, I mean, it's, that, that becomes just a decision-making problem, right? So if it doesn't pass, you, you still have those uh, assets that are out there. Um, you know, that's gonna be, uh, you're gonna live within your means, right? So, you know, does that probably means a lot more deferred maintenance. Um, you could probably live with that for some amount of time. And that, that, as things happen, I think that's where, you know, uh, Brian, Har uh, Dr. Harrison and his team come to the board and say, hey, this happened, what should we do? So that, that's, that's good. Thank you very much. All right, here we go. So thanks, Christina, that's an excellent question. I'm sure that everybody here is thinking about it. I think um, there's a little bit of education to be had um, just as a, as a background. 20 years ago, our community took out bonds to build schools and do improvements. Those bonds are coming due, so this is an opportunity to reinvest in our schools and in our community. Um, it's $185 million is what the referendum is asking for, and there are three key, three or four key things that they want to do, that we want to do as our community. Um, safety is one of the top issues. I was on the community group for the Blueprint 220, and one of the things that came out was that the people in the community were concerned about the mobiles and safety in our schools. So that's one of the top priorities, is to replace the mobiles with classrooms at Station Prairie and Grove, and to upgrade safety. Um, another concern that came up is um, the infrastructure. There are deferred maintenance that's been put off, things like boilers, roofs, pavement, parking at some of these schools, in and out. If you go to the elementaries, you know what I'm talking about, right? Lines, North Barrington, Prairie, there are traffic issues there all the time, and it's safety for our students. Um, thirdly, adding on to new spaces, improving our schools for the future and best practices. Um, the auditorium at the high school was built in 1948. It doesn't seat enough seats to put the whole freshman class in. A new auditorium will give additional learning space for group projects. They could have the whole class. It'll open up situations where, let's say, all the history teachers want to teach a class. They can do it. We don't have group space there. Um, also, additions on sports facilities. The time is ticking here. I know too much about this. I apologize. <laughs> so let's wrap it up. Okay. Um, it's very important. If it doesn't pass, the new school board is going to have a big problem because there is a lot of things on the fix-it list. It's too much money for the summer budget. An example is the bridge that broke going from the high school to Field of Dreams. That, whoop, $800,000 had to be fixed. So we are going to have to have a hard problem and a discussion about what to do. It may be another ask later, which will be harder because it will be more money. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> She's got more information. I'm not going to talk about anything that's in the referendum. You did a great job. Um, okay, so the referendum. I did not vote in support of the referendum that will be placed on the April 2nd ballot. That does not mean that I do not find immense value in many of the things that are listed in this referendum. When we first began this discussion about two years ago, I was advocating for a conservative approach and a two-step process. I was looking to um, see if I could gather a little support with regard to um, doing some of those immediate maintenance and safety uh, improvements in our school, and then wait and see what is happening with some of these developments that are coming up to see if maybe we needed to add additional space as part of a second referendum. That didn't really gather a lot of steam at the board table as well as at the referendum committee because I think that people who've been through this process before said, you really have one shot at this. So we engaged a consultant who uh, ran a lot of um, uh, surveys. We did an online survey, we did a telephone survey, and we engaged uh, a community group, probably a lot of you in this room volunteered, thank you, 
uh, to be part of this group to get a feeling as to what is the appropriate number that we need to look for that will create a successful referendum. And each of our uh, matrix that came back from those, uh, from those areas all came back with the same decision. If we stay with a cost neutral solution to improving our schools, that type of referendum would have the greatest success with our community. So that is the, um, that was the number that I was uh, advocating for at the board table because like Leah said, if it does not pass, our, our, our district is going to have some significant issues and I'd like for this re referendum to be successful. Um, so that's why I voted the way that I did and um, that's, uh, that's it. <laughs> in, in all areas, referendums are hard sell. Asking people to open up their pocketbooks a little bit more um, is, is, you really have to give that a lot of thought and make sure that if you are allocating more money to the schools that it's going to be used well and economically and with your pocketbooks you know, in mind. Um, and this referendum is a hard sell. I totally support it. I really think that what we are asking for are needs and not wants. Uh, even you know, fixing the parking lots are needs and not wants. The new art center is a real need. It's not just a want. And of course, the most important thing is the safety and security in our schools. That is a definite, definite need and not want. As we've said before, good schools drive property values. And this referendum will make our good schools even better. And we'll make sure that our, our, um, the, the money that we put into our schools is, is, is well used. Keep them in, in good, good shape. Um, if this doesn't pass, we're gonna have to go back, like, like my, uh, my friends on, on the table here have all said, we're gonna have to go back and just prioritize and really think hard what we can afford and what we can't afford. But I really think we need the full go to really do what this district needs right now. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that all of you will support the referendum, as I do. And uh, again, it's, for the, it's really for the good schools. Preventive maintenance is really what we're trying to do here to make sure that our schools continue to stay in great shape. I have to agree with everyone here. I think I do support the referendum and I think education of the, um, the district is key to getting it to pass. I think we have a lot of things and challenges ahead of us that are going to be important for us to tackle, especially safety. I am truly concerned about how the students are moved to and from, you know, buses the, the, to the cars um, being picked up at some of the schools around the area. And that I would like to make sure that um, each student has the ability to get to and from classes and to be able to have the best education going forward. I mean, we're not in the best condition as far as education goes uh, compared to some of the other countries in the world. So even though we are an excellent school district and we have an opportunity, I think, to be able to improve upon that um, for our students, especially our students with special needs. So if the referendum doesn't pass, it'll be a lot of prioritizing the most important uh, problems in our schools and we'll be able to tackle those one at a time as best we can. A little bit less immediately accessible to the audience. I don't know if everybody has read about this. Um, issue, but the Illinois Association of School Boards uh, did vote on whether local school boards should have the authority to decide to arm their teachers. In other words, our school board, all the other school boards in the state, came together as part of their association and voted, are we going to let individual school districts decide whether to arm their teachers? Um, it's believed that this vote will be coming up again. Do you feel school boards, individual school boards like ours, should have the authority to arm teachers and staff or to allow them to carry a weapon in the school? Would it be appropriate to arm Barrington 220 teachers? Why or why not do you believe this is appropriate? This is not surprising that this question came to me first. <laughs> so in October, our board uh, looked at a number of resolutions and um, as Christine mentioned, resolution two, uh, was provided by a, a small rural district that was looking for the ability to have local control on how they provide safety and security in their school districts. And included in that resolution was a, um, the option of developing student safety and protection plans which may 
that will include administrators, faculty, or other staff to be armed. I voted yes to this resolution, as did the majority of our board, and this was not a uh, vote that suggested that we should arm Barrington teachers. Um, I, I hope that uh, people have, have Obviously, this is a group of people that pays close attention to the Board of Education and the decisions that we make. I have been a huge advocate for safety and security in our district. I have joined the Safety and Security Committee as one of the uh, co-members of the Board of Education. It's a new committee. In that committee, I can list about 20 things that we have done. Uh, we have rekeyed all the buildings so teachers can lock doors from inside, upgraded all the cameras, we put uh, numbers on the inside and outside of doors so that emergency responders can have access. Um, I'm going to run out of time before I hit to the most important parts, but I just want to say that in all of the meetings, in all of the discussions, in all of the decisions that we have made, never was the discussion to arm Barrington teachers. This was an issue looking at a local community that needed, that was asking for the ability to make uh, local decisions to protect their students. I pulled statistics before we did the vote. Mercer County is ranked, I just need one more minute. Uh, Mercer County is ranked out of 638 schools in Illinois. It was ranked 506 safest schools in the state of Illinois. And this is the community that came and asked for this resolution. It takes emergency responders over 30 minutes to get to any of their schools. They have five schools in three counties. Their parents are nervous. And I know Thank as a parent, I am always very nervous about this issue as well. So I, I do not support arming Barrington teachers. This was made as a decision to support local control of local school districts. Thank you. And then we'll pass back down. Yeah. Go back yeah. and do someone. And can I ask you all, when you are not the speaker, if you sit back a little bit, then the audience can see each person that is speaking. So maybe the person that's speaking will lean forward a little and the others will lean back a little. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Just to finish the story that was brought up in the scenario, this was voted down by the, the majority of the school boards. So this resolution, we, we sent representatives from you know each of the school boards, one of ours went, and bottom line was this, in the state of Illinois, proponents of school board said, no, we should not arm teachers. And I agree with that 100%. I think that's a very important message there. Um, I, I, I think when school boards want to talk about how they can do safety, they absolutely need to use uh, local law enforcement to uh, you know, be, be part of that discussion. But um, I do not believe that arming teachers is going to make our schools safer. And it's very concerning um, when we think about arming teachers, uh, we're increasing significantly risk to students. We're um, increasing the risk of unintended shootings, uh, the gun that the teacher has getting out of his or her person and someone else getting that or getting lost. Um, and it's just hard to make these kind of split second life, life or death decisions. Um, so we do need to look for other ways to keep our, our school safe. And I think the bottom line is prevention is going to be the best way to keep our school safe. The kinds of things that our schools are doing now with the locks and, and um, uh, limiting access to the school once the kids are in the school are very important. But we want the kids to feel safe in school. And the kids do not feel safe if they know there are guns in the school. It's, it's been proven, it's been, it's been researched, and it's just something that we have to really work from that point on and look for other ways to make sure that we can keep kids safe. Addressing student health and mental health needs empowering teachers to intervene when they see something's needed, increasing the number of counselors in the school so there's more touch points where students can, can, can have people that they can access. Bottom line, I am not in favor of ever having guns in the schools. Society that um, we have other opportunities to, to address safety issues in different ways. There are a multitude of, of options for teachers and parents, um, education being one of them, um, counseling being another. I believe that there's other ways to tackle this safety issue. And I think that with any luck, we'll be able to find those things that are necessary to help our students to be able to understand that there's other choices um, out there for them. 
So I think this is like a two part question really is the first part is, you know, should um, boards and uh, decision makers be allow uh, individual districts to make their own choices? Um, I think the separate, there's another part of that choice was should Barrington 220 be having, um, you know, uh, faculty with being armed, et cetera. The first part is you really have to have, not every district is the same. We're very lucky to live in such a district that we don't perceive that as a high risk threat. There might be other districts that might see that. I would give them that choice. The reality here is it's really just a trade off of the risk. You know, Nassim Talib's got a great book, Black Swan, talks about this specific low, low tail risk events. It's a very complicated issue. Um, these low probability events, I mean, you're really kind of fighting this game of a possibility of happening and then introducing a new a weapon into a, you know, with a everyday low probability event happening. It becomes a very complicated risk trade-off. Um, I am not for a guns in school by any means, but at the same time, I think the original question how it came up was, should certain districts be allowed to make that choice? So. So this is a really good question and people are concerned. People are really concerned about safety in the schools. Um, talking to people in the community, they, they think about this, you know? And this is a controversial issue. Um, people have strong views about this. Uh, right now, it's illegal to have guns in schools in Illinois. So it's illegal. But if it comes up again, um, I think that the board might have missed an opportunity to reach out to the community to get their input. Other communities around Chicagoland had community, community meetings to see how people felt about it. Um, you know, as a board, board member, it's not really important what my opinion is, it's what your opinion is and how you feel about this. So I, I would look to that. Um, there are statistics, strong statistics about more guns and more violence. Um, but I think we need to look to the community. I think it's important and, you know, as some of my panel members have said, other things are happening in the district. I talked with Steve McWilliams a week ago and he's got a new mental health wellness team going at the high school. He's got psychologists, counselor, um, two deans, and they're working to give extra support for students who might have extra, uh, extra needs, more than the typical student at the high school, to help these students and be preventative for having any kind of dangerous situation and work at it from that direction, which I think is very healthy and we're, we're very fortunate to have, have our principal and our staff digging deep into this problem in a preventative way, in a healthy way for our community, because I think that's, that's one of the ways. And you know, Angela mentioned a lot of other things going on with safety in the district that, that are very important that are happening. And so people are paying attention here. There's a lot of attention. And as a board member, I would continue to focus on that because it's very important and people are very concerned. Thank you all very much. And it's gonna be starting with Eva and then going down the line. And let me just say, I did not write any of these questions, so do not hate me when I ask <laughs> I would not want to have to answer some of these questions myself. That's why I'm moderating and not running for the board. <laughs> Great. So, yeah. I've added Can't it. wait for this one. Um, so uh, I'm stalling for time because this one is rough. Um, if it were to become necessary, what existing programs or district policies would you eliminate or reduce to ensure a continued balanced budget, especially in light of the state of Illinois' ongoing budget issues? Um, I know this is a tough one, so give me your best. Oh, yeah, I'm terrified. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think that there are a lot of things that our school does, district does very, very well, and I think there are ways to look at um, the expenditures and see where the bang for our buck is. Um, I think that in eliminating any programs, I would hope that we could avoid that at all possible, um, but I'm sure there's other ways to uh, fund these things by either parent involvement or volunteerism or, um, just a myriad of ways of, of, of fundraising to be able to come up with um, alternative ways to pay for specific programs in our schools. Um, with any luck, you know, we'll, as a board, we'll be able to find those things should it ever come necessary. But um, I also hope that it, with that same respect that we can um, 
put the money where we really need to spend it and um, help our schools and our students. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a really tough, I mean, that's, that's a really tough uh, question to, uh, to go after. I, I really think it's a process of, you, you work with Dr. Harrison's team, you figure out what the, the cost per any one individual um, uh, program or concept, and then my belief is really, how I would look at it is really valuing what is happening in the classroom versus outside the classroom. And at that point is really making those trade-off decisions of, you know, hey, this is a core part of the education. It's in the classroom. We're teaching you skills. There's a social emotional aspect of the support systems that you need to really have the, um, the children and the students to uh, be successful in the future. Um, and then there might be some things that might have trade offs that may not be around that specific goal. And that's how I would look at those trade offs. So thanks for having really testing us here today. You're getting down and dirty here to see what we, what we think, and that's great. Um, you know, I think the teachers are the heart and soul of our district. If you have a student, you know, you know this. They're spending their whole day with, with their teacher in elementary school, and that's that's a significant thing. And I we've experienced many wonderful teachers. Middle school, they're hopping around, but you know, you know your students. If, if math is hard, you need a good math teacher. If English is hard, you need a good English teacher. So I would strive to always, always keep our teachers, keep our class sizes within boundaries. Um, and our programs are awesome. We, people come here for our programs. Um, we don't wanna cut those things. Um, I've watched our board in tough times. They have their budget meetings. They start in January. They look at what the projected students are, what the <coughs> projected taxes are, and what our budget is. And they tweak it as they go along. It's a long process, you know. In February, they're like, how many teachers will we need? March, April, May, what does it look like? Summertime, August, uh-oh, uh-oh, what if, what if this, you know? Dr. Harris, cut 10 per, 5%, see what you can do. And he comes back and he's cut some things. They say, don't cut the teachers. You know, and so this is a process, and we're in Illinois, it's a nightmare, okay? I get it, we don't know what's gonna happen. We just don't, so we have to plan. And I've watched the board, they're very diligent, and I plan to follow their example, to keep our AAA bond rating, keep us financially stable, so that we can have options. But you don't know what's gonna happen, so the board has, you know, a five-year plan. They're not looking, oh, just this year, no, 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 no. We gotta look to the future and say, what if, what if, what if. And, and Angela does a great job of that too as a board member. So I would want to continue that because it's super important, you know. That keeps us strong because we can know that we're financially solid and even in times of trouble. So we had this exact same question four years ago. Um, and I remember I was sitting next to Brian Battle and he said, no cuts. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but unfortunately, I do think that almost every year we do go to Dr. Harris, like Leah had mentioned, um, trying to find cost savings because you're right, Illinois is a difficult state to uh, plan and budget in. You know, we have a, a, a state that has near junk status on its, uh, you know, ratings, but yet we operate in a district where we have a AAA bond rating. So um, over the years that I've been on the board, we have found cost savings that did not affect the classroom. Uh, we eliminated two administrative uh, positions the first year that I was on the board. Um, we reorganized the IT staff, which was extremely painful, um, but uh, saved about a half a million dollars for the district. We have been uh, involved in uh, energy uh, consumption reduction that saved about two million for the district in the past three years. Next year, our consultant will roll off of the books, so we'll have an additional 200,000 savings each year. Uh, we joined a consortium on the North Shore to reduce school fuel tax. Um, we have uh, looked at the way that we use substitute teachers and reduced uh, our spending from about 2.3 million a few years ago down to 1.7 million last year. So, you know, we have made strides to reduce uh, spending in ways that does not affect the classroom. To the extent of, um, you know, affecting the classroom, I looked through my notes from the last discussion. I'm going to read this really quickly. And uh, I, I said this last year, maybe I didn't say it, but I wrote it at least last year. I can remember the names of all my teachers from kindergarten to eighth grade. I suspect many of you can as well. I know the teacher who turned my, oh shoot, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I know the teacher who turned my little boy's view of himself as a fidgety learner who got off track to a creative little boy. Mrs. Floyd and Mrs. Parisi, a first year teacher at Countryside, 
who saw the potential in my daughter's reading and truly embraced individualized learning. So certainly supporting our teachers, keeping class sizes low, and giving students access to quality educators uh, something that I view as of the utmost importance that should never be cut in this district. I didn't know that Brian Battle said this, but I'll quote him and say, no cuts. <laughs> I, I do agree with that. I have to say, you have to spend money to save money. So I go back to the referendum. If we can do some of the things that we can do to some of these schools, we're gonna save money in the long haul um, on energy costs, on, on other types of costs, the, the soft costs that really could save the board some, some money. Um, I agree with what was said. If, if we have to hit on the parents, uh, increase parental fees for some of the programs so that we don't have to cut programs, especially uh, the arts and the, and, and the uh, sports. And I would say the last time I looked at, at the, um, the, the number of students per class, we are a little below on class sizes. So I would say, you know, I understand that we have a, um, a contract on what the maximum class sizes are, but if we have to, I would say let's maximize the class sizes to the extent that the contract allows us. And if that means that we, we have reduction in force of a couple of uh, teachers, and again, I don't want to, I'm hoping that would be through retirements. I'm not suggesting we have to you know, fire anybody, but maximize the class sizes so that we are using our dollars in the most efficient way possible. But again, it, I, I don't want to talk about cuts, and I will defer to the administration uh, if and when that time comes, and we'll have to work together to make some really hard decisions, because it would be a very hard decision. We all want to have excellent education in Barrington, and it's hard to make cuts. It's hard to take away something that's so good and so, so well-received and, and so much appreciated. And um, you know, as I said, my five kids have gone through the Barrington schools and they had everything they needed and they were well, well, well uh, uh, educated. And I would just want future generations to have that same opportunity here, so. Thank you very much for the answer. Um, Carol Marine's got nothing on the hard-hitting PTO President's Council. Because <laughs> here we go with another one to clobber you with. We need to get to start on this one. Here we go. How many school board meetings did you attend in the year prior to filing your candidacy? And how many have you attended since announcing your <coughs> intention to run for a seat? We'll start with Leah and then we'll move back around. Angela, this is going to kind of be an easy one for you. <laughs> Here we go, thanks for that question. Um, I've been paying attention to the school board for a long time and I've been faithfully attending meetings um, since last August. Before that was hit or miss, I had to miss one or two because of family commitments and uh, that's it. Roughly five billion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have attended, I maybe have missed one because of work, but I have attended all of the school board meetings. Um, I also, um, and as I mentioned before, a member of the policy committee, uh, and we meet uh, monthly. I'm a member of the insurance uh, committee, and we meet mo monthly. Uh, I'm a member of the safety and security committee, and we meet, we started out meeting quarterly, and now we're meeting about monthly, maybe five weeks. Um, I'm on the um, uh, utilization uh, committee, um, or asset utilization committee. Uh, we meet, I think, quarterly, and um, about, let's see, last year, I think we wrapped up the PSEO uh, committee, and I was uh, part of a co-chair committee to renegotiate the BSEO contract, and that took over a year and um, countless meetings, but it is a beautiful contract. If you like to read contracts, you should get on our website, pull this baby up. It is, it is superb. I wrote a couple of things myself that are pretty pretty spiffy, I might say. <laughs> Prior to announcing that I wanted to join the school board that year, I probably personally was at no more than two or three board meetings. However, with, uh, and I'm not technologically spectacular, with the website and online, I have reviewed um, just about every board meeting the year prior to um, my announcing. And I certainly at least have checked on the agendas and when there were things that were important to me or things that I was interested in, I could zoom in on those specific subjects. Since I've announced, 
I've been to at least one board meeting a month. There's usually two per month. And um, the first month, I, I went to both board meetings. So I try to get to one at least one every month. And um, it's very interesting just to watch how the board acts and how they interact with each other and, and how things are done. So it's been very educational for me to, to actually physically be at the board meeting. I have attended a few of the board meetings prior to my candidacy, and um, but for the most part, I've been looking online and reviewing the board meetings from the past, and so I'm trying to get myself educated as much as I can on um, what the board is uh, working on. Yeah, and for me, I've been to one board meeting in uh, person. I've uh, thanks to all the technology from uh, Barrington 220, you can easily look up, uh, watch the you know watch the board meeting itself, look through the uh, agenda. It's a great uh, way, of, a very efficient way of going through that process. Um, so I've done through, you know half a dozen half a dozen of those. Um, really, as an informational piece to see what's happening and uh, get up to speed on the issues. So uh, I've been to a fac uh, facilities committee meeting. Uh, in person, just to see that process, how they how they make the sausage, so to speak, of uh, the decisions getting made. Eva, and uh, here's your question. We'll start with Gary. If elected, what new initiative or idea would you bring to the Board of Education, and how would your idea or ideas benefit the students and the staff of Barrington 220? And you've got um, 90 seconds, you both have 90 seconds if you'd like to use your whole time. So a couple ideas that I've been thinking about over the course of the last months while I've been a candidate. Um, and this is not a criticism of Barrington as it is, but things that I see where we can improve. Um, the first is finding other ways to communicate um, the greatness of Barrington with our um, our district. Uh, there are more people who live in the Barrington 220 uh, tax area who don't have children in the schools than do. There are more homes that are, are either empty nesters or they have very young kids or they don't have their kids yet. And we need to figure out how to really get the word out, even like with the re referendum that we have right now. Um, so certainly online has helped a little bit, but I'm still not convinced that we've really gotten the word out to people. My neighbors didn't know about the musical that, that had just occurred and you know was, was so well received. So we've got to figure out ways to get the word out and it may mean going back to the old fashioned snail mail because not everybody is online, for example. Um, so number one would be increasing communication, not just within the schools. I think the PTO does a great job of communicating with parents that are, who have kids in the schools, but outside the school. The other is I would like to look for more ways to uh, improve inclusivity, uh, to be very sensitive to all the students' needs, the kids that don't feel like they belong in the school, or some of the special ed kids that really don't feel part of the, um, the, the overall population of the school. And uh, I think some of the administration has, has uh, um, started looking at some of that. I wanna encourage that that continues. So those are two initiatives I would work on. Um, I kind of second that that idea about um, inclusivity in the students. Um, my son with ADHD struggled through school, not educationally, but but with um, other students, having friends, being able to um, and participate in certain um, like sports, for example. And so the only initiative, and I'm very open, I'm not uh, having a, a specific agenda, but. I would like to investigate and look into more ways for um, students such as my son Brandon to be able to be more successful socially in school. Thank you. Anybody have I'll, a chip out? I'll throw it. Sure. Right. Angel's got a chip. I feel like gambling. Yeah. Open player here, huh? Um, well, I, I think that this is something that the board has discussed in the past, and I'm hoping that this is something that we'll, we'll be able to accomplish. Uh, at uh, you know the best routes for transportation, we invested in some software last year, and now we've uh, you know provided GPS uh, tracking on all of our um, school buses. So I'm hoping that this will be a way that we can really increase um, the, the efficiencies of our school buses and you know bring down the cost somewhat, but also you know try to oh did, did you talk about was it stuff? No. Okay. Increase efficiency in transportation. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Um, the next question is going to be directed to Matthew and Leah. 
what is your position on the district utilizing e-learning and blended learning, the concept of combining use of technology online and so on, along with classroom instruction? Can you share with us your You're, you're saying e-learning as in technology-based? Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, as running a technology firm, I'm 100% uh, on board for uh, utilizing technology as a scale mechanism, really not just for the students, uh, I would all, I'd love to also see it be integrated into the labor union and the teacher um, ways of doing business. I think they have really missed out on some of the innovative ideas in utilizing technology to really scale their craft. Um, it would, you know, as a futuristic uh, thinker, I, I, I think it's more, you know, it would be ideal for teachers to become rock stars. So someone who's just really good at crafting their, their trade and utilizing technology in which to broaden their audience. I think there's a great way to do that with the labor unions as well as the districts and finding some way to create a revenue center. And you know, if someone's really, really good, great at, at giving a math presentation, let them let them figure out a way to scale that to more people. So I really, really believe in that. So anyway. So there are a couple important components to this question. Um, it's a really good question too. I think you never want to take away the benefit of one-on-one -on -one time with a teacher. You know, my, my friend next to me made you cry when she talked about teacher experience. It's very important. Um, the kids learn different than we did. It's a little bit different in the classroom. When I was at Prairie last week, there were kids in a math class and they were all sitting in little groups doing math. And then at the end of the time, they all like gathered together to wrap it up in a group. Um, the blended learning, they're trying it out. They've been successful with it in some classes. One class that I heard about that I thought was interesting and kids liked was the fitness class at the high school. They wear Fitbit, they have to get their steps in. They don't necessarily have to go to gym class every day if they're doing their fitness on their own time, but they report in and they learn a life skill. They manage their own fitness. So it's different than what we did and it's good and it's not right for every kid, but it's excellent for some kids. You know, Another example, my son is in a Spanish class they have blended learning. So they're, sometimes they're all in a big group. Sometimes they're in small groups with the teacher, depending on little projects. And he says, oh, Friday, I can go to the commons and work on my, my group project with my group. I don't have to be in class. So these are ways that they can blend the learning and use technology that are beneficial for our students. So I think we need to keep up with the times, but we also want to keep our, our, our teachers and keep our interactions and the personal touch that we have with these excellent teachers. <coughs> Thank you very much. Anybody want to chip in for this one? Or? Okay. All right, next question is gonna to go to Angelo first and then to Barry. So we know from everything we read in the media and often from our own children that stress, anxiety, and depression are becoming increasingly common at all grade levels and are, are very worrisome to us as parents, grandparents, teachers, and so on. What, if any, initiatives would you support or what changes would you make in Barrington 220 to address these urgent mental health and social emotional needs? That is a fantastic question. So um, we at District 220 really support uh, social and emotional well-being and mental health at every level of instruction at the instructional piece, meaning that our teachers are trained um, to uh, provide instruction and explanation regarding um, good digital citizenship and a positive body image and the dangers associated with vaping and understanding if you are feeling stressed and reporting bullying online and uh, the, blue the blue dot initiative at the high school and the see something, say something initiative that's really across all of our elementary, middle and high school curriculum. So, um, you know, as a district, we realize the stressors that are put on children and that these continue to grow each year. I don't see this uh, as a problem that's going away anytime soon. So uh, we've really put a focus on this uh, as far as our um, you know, training for staff and administrators and uh, to focus their efforts on, on children and also identifying if uh, you know, there's a children or if there's a child that is um, communicating in a way online that is on a district device that is, is worrisome. Um, you know, there are certain algorithms that our district will pick up on and make sure that they intervene to provide uh, assistance to that particular child. Thank you. We'll pass the microphone back there. Uh, 
Yeah, unfortunately, kids, more high school, but certainly middle school, and kids are under a lot of stress, whether it's, you know, parental divorce, whether it's just, you know, two parents working, and so they come home to an empty house, whether it's feeling isolated, they don't have a lot of friends, or they're being bullied. Um, so, you know, our district needs to be aware of everything that's happening outside the school that impacts how the kids are doing, uh, you know, uh, in school. Um, and we certainly need to look for ways to kind of decrease the stigma of mental health issues, to encourage kids to ask for help. Um, as I had mentioned, uh, answering a previous question, um, I think increasing the number of counselors we have and mandating that the counselors have a certain number of touch points with each of the kids, especially freshman, sophomore year, that um, not just when they do their schedule, but they, they, they meet with them and just kind of see how you're doing. Um, empowering the teachers to really get to know a certain number of students, mentoring them um, when they observe something happening, grades dropping, or the kids just looking, falling asleep in class or looking sad, following up on that, whether they follow up with the counselor, whether they follow up with the parents. Um, we want to teach our parents. We want to help them to be better parents. Things like having dinner together, turning off cell phones, turning off the, the, the television and just having dinner together three or four times a week, if not seven nights a week. Um, helping parents to, to tell when their kids are stressed and opening up lines of communication with parents. So there are a lot of things we can be doing just to make these kids feel more comfortable in, in school and then outside of school. And we've got chip, two chips, we're in. All right, we're chips first. All right, I chip first. Up in the ante. Okay. And I'm gonna ask Matthew to sit back a little so these people don't have to see you. So I'm just gonna ask the audience, who has a high school student right now? Who's had a high school student go through the district? Okay, these kids are stressed, right? We live in a high stress community. We're not the only one in the Chicago land area. Um, so as part of my homework as being a candidate, I've tried to talk to an elementary principal, a middle principal, and a high school principal about a little bit deeper search of what's going on with social emotional learning. And I have to say, I was pretty pleased to find out there's a lot more going on than I expected and how it's intertwined through the day. Oh man, the time is ticking. Okay, step it up. So, we do a really good job. There's cold time at the middle school. There's special things at the elementary. The high school has the new wellness team that I mentioned. However, I think there's more to be done. Um, there's studies from Stanford, there are other high schools, in, or other districts, sorry, in the nation, where K through 12 district, we could do a more comprehensive approach. I agree with Barry, there's, there's community message, there's parent message, there's modeling, there's check in, check out throughout the day at one elementary, it'd be great to have it. Um, I'm on board with this, and I think as a community, there's, there's great things happening, but more to be done in a comprehensive way. And I know some of you out there care about this too, talking to people in the community. I just want to reiterate kind of what I said before is in, in my business, really the, the type of people coming out of school now are very different than the people that, you know, it's called 10, 15 years ago. Um, they behave differently. They, the, the reward systems are very different. Um, and I think there's a lot of stress in the schools just because of somewhat, we're becoming very flexible and uh, there's a lot more, uh, I, anyway, I want to get to the point where I, I believe in the flexible seating, the future needs of schools. I think they're going to look differently. I think the way people respond to group settings is very different than how we probably are used to it. Uh, you have to really make people comfortable uh, in, in their environments in which to learn. So I really just want to use this time as a, I support the, uh, the flexible learning environments, etc. Thank you. Do I get everybody who wants to um, it's a competitive world and a lot of our parents are, are hoping to get their kids into the best schools possible so they put them in programs and sports and trying to make their resume on their um, applications to be spectacular I mean we've noticed um, in the news today that um, some parents bribed their ways to get their kids into school so that puts a lot of pressure on students to be successful. And I think that a lot of times as parents, we don't have the skill set necessary to be able to help them recognize when they're pushing themselves too hard. So a program to help students and parents to be able to de-stress would be an opportunity we think we could look forward to or help our parents. Excuse me, I'm catching a cold. So Excuse me, Bob, and then to Matthew. So we all know that you can debate school and college ratings all day long, you know, how the different factors are related, affects the rating of a school or a college, and you might 
agree or not agree with what factors are weighted in that. So understanding that um, school ratings can be a, a little bit subjective determined by uh, what factors they choose and how they weight them. But uh, a community member um, wanted to know, they felt that a uh, few of the Barrington 220 schools may have slipped a little bit in their school report card ratings recently. What will you do to boost our ratings for all schools in Barrington 220? We'll start with Eva and then we'll go to Matt. Um, I think that the ratings that we are putting pressures on schools to be able to get the best grades from our students. And um, I think that with forward learning, um, different educational opportunities for students, like in such as uh, computer learning, and, and we're, we're moving in that direction. We're trying to find ways to be able to help our students do better. And um, I think that in computer learning or different ways of, that kids learn, uh, identifying those things in, the, in each student would help us to be able to improve their educational uh, productivity and be able to um, improve the, the grading system and um, how well would they, they perform in our standard testing. But I don't think standard testing necessarily is a way for identifying how well your student learns. I mean, my son doesn't test well, but he is a very smart kid and is able to uh, do any of the tasks that's required to be able to pass in school. So I think that if we can learn ways to be able to help him to be more successful in the testing environment or getting them more opportunities to test longer, to be able to read the questions, to be able to understand the question and be able to perform better. I mean, I. I I really look at it as it's just a, an experiment of, well, can you isolate the problem? Uh, are you getting enough data through the school, wherever this is happening, is there a way to get, get enough data points to figure out what was the ca cause of this issue, if there is an issue, or if this is just an anomaly? Um, I think that's the approach to have. I think overall, this, you know, the schools, I mean, that's what we're very proud of here, is the, the great school. So is it, a, is it a teacher issue? Is it a student issue? Is it a curriculum issue? Uh, I think you just have to look at the data points and see if you can isolate the problem. Thank you. Are they chipping in? No? Okay. All right, our next question is going to go to Leah first and then to Angela. Looking at Barrington and society at large, what do each of you think are the biggest challenges that face students today? What are the biggest challenges students are facing today at all grade levels? Sorry, can you just say it one more time? Sure. Yeah. So just looking at Barrington and society in general, and what do you think are the biggest challenges facing students today at any and all of the grade levels? That's a very thoughtful question. Um, I think as a community, we really want to provide an atmosphere, a school district, that's going to support our students and help them to grow up to be good members of society that can contribute and have have balance and care about people and, and, and their, their community. Uh, it's not all about testing and grades and being, you know, getting into the Ivy League College. I think as a community, we need to value each student individually and help them take their path from kindergarten through high school and be successful and feel good about themselves. I think it's important to, to integrate social emotional learning because that's that's every day for every student. And you've seen, you know, your students struggle. You know, they have a bad day, they have a good day. We want them to, to be able to be resilient. We want our kids to learn those skills. So when something goes wrong, they can, they can self solve their problems. They can soothe themselves. They can figure out a problem. They can find another adult they trust to ask about the problem. So we want to be those things. It's not the end all and be all of being a great school district by the numbers and by the test scores. We want to be a full balanced uh, community for our students. It's a different world than it was when we were students. There's social media, there's stress. That's just a whole nother level of stress that we didn't have. So we need to be there to support them as parents, community members, and as a school district. So I think that you know, probably one of the most important challenges that our folks facing uh, both very interested in 220 students as well as students across the nation is um, you know getting a quality diverse education first and foremost uh, second of all uh, feeling that they are in a safe and secure environment um, and then third of all I think this goes right back to the question that I was asked I think the last question which is really managing the stress of being a high achieving district and having a lot of high achieving students within this district. 
Um, and, and that stress is really compounded by a lot of the um, you know, wonderful attributes that we can provide for our clients and assistance with our clients, our students with, uh, sorry lawyer, um, <laughs> with technology. Um, but with that comes you know, a trade-off as well. So I don't know if any of you read the, um, there was an article that was published by Be Strong, I think it was written by a middle school teacher uh, regarding the change in environment between being a student in middle school in 2008 and a student in middle school in 2018. And I am a crier, so I am not going to get into specifics, but essentially what it was was, you know, little guy grabs his, his uh, lunch, slips and falls, falls all over him, super embarrassed in 2008, goes to the bathroom, cleans up, comes back, whoosh, not a lot of people saw, okay. 2018, you know, little guy slips and falls, spills his stuff all over him, another kid videos it, it's all over social media, and he suddenly has a new nickname that he has to deal with for the rest of his high school career. It's, it's challenging for our kids, and I think that providing those emotional supports, um, you know, with our counselors, our teachers, and all of the, um, you know, the, the programming that we've implemented in our schools is, is very imperative. Thank you all. Anyone else speak for that? Oh, okay. Very good. <laughs> I, I totally agree with what has been said already. I think it's important that we all realize as parents um, that the family dynamics have changed. Education has changed. There's a lot of e-learning and, and the computers. And unfortunately, all our kids are plugged into their electronics more than they need to be. Um, but the family dynamics have changed also. Um, and we want, as parents, and hopefully teachers and counselors, to really encourage our kids to all have a balance in life. Put down the electronics. Get involved in something, whether it's volunteer work, whether it's working after school if you're in high school, whether it's joining a club. It, you don't have to be the star quarterback to join. Um, but all kids need to have a balance in life. It's not just reading the books and answering the math questions. Um, and I think it's just important that we help our kids to each have an individual self-worth, that they, they want to emphasize that they're each individuals, not to compare to other kids, but to themselves, and encourage that, and, and thrive. We want them all to thrive. If any of us have read, um, either online on Facebook, or through the Daily Herald, or the Courier, um, or other publications um, from the school districts um, or elsewhere, about the two developments uh, proposed in the Hoffman Estates, one being AT&T and one being Columbia Farms at the intersection of, of 59 and 72 over by the Arboretum. Um, these are potentially large developments that could potentially put quite a few students into our district. It's a very complex issue that we cannot fully address today by any means, but um, what a community member wanted to ask uh, you to, and anybody else who wants to answer is, what would you do as a school board member to help ensure that additional developments like these two can be appropriately absorbed into Barrington 220 and can also be funded? What would you do to address those issues? Now, I have to admit some ignorance in terms of what our um, current uh, setup is with, with developers. Um, I know at one point when, when some of the Arboretum was being developed, they had actually development fees. They actually charged per home. I don't know if that still exists or not. But we definitely need to make sure that if these homes are coming into our district, that the people who are buying into these homes make a contribution to the district to allow us to provide the great education that we, we provide them. Um, we certainly would have to look at the Enrollment Monitoring Committee to redo uh, uh, school boundaries because Rural school could not handle all these students if, if that situation occurred. Um, so even though they're going to be bringing tax dollars into the district, that's not going to be enough to, to mitigate what they're bringing in terms of the needs um, from busing their kids, from you know hiring more teachers if that's needed. Um, and it, it's a very difficult situation. Um, so I think it's something we would have to stay on top of. And I would, again, defer to the administration who probably is more on top of this than, than, than we are, and I certainly would, would want their um, guidance in terms of how we would try to uh, uh, encompass these kids and these homes into our district. I mean, I think it's really ultimately about, you know, realizing things like that are gonna happen. You have to define the problem, 
figure out what possible solutions there are to have it. You can work together in a collaborative way. Is it building new schools, et cetera? I mean, you have to figure out the, the, the list of solutions. Some of them may not be so nice and you might have to take them to court or find you know, um, non-collaborative ways to, to figure out a, a solution. But these are all solutions and I think it's just a board is really just working with the district, figuring out what those are and working through each of those problems. So because of time, I'll just address the, the two uh, properties that you mentioned. So with the AT&T property, um, you know, we are anticipating that if this proposal goes forward as uh, anticipated, that it will bring roughly maybe 100 kids to the district, um, which we are you know, fairly comfortable with at this time that we can absorb in our current schools. Uh, with regard to the Hoffman Estates uh, development, that is, is not quite as well defined. Uh, and you know, we are uh, engaged in um, some discussions and, and some, um, some litigation at this point concerning uh, that development. So that goes back to my point at the beginning of uh, the referendum discussion when we were, some, some members of the board were, felt that it was um, not comfortable to, to not be building additional space, but yet as we look at our current enrollment numbers, we're relatively flat. And uh, you know, so we are kind of looking forward to this new development to see if the students actually do come to District 220 and, and what that means for us. So um, it, it is an issue and uh, we're working on it. Oh, and one other thing, we, we were able to successfully uh, eliminate the TIF uh, request for Brian uh, Battle and Brian Harris primarily uh, that was being uh, submitted uh, from the Hoffman Estates development. So Angela, of course, answered very eloquently again in a very informative way. So as a board member, I would want to be actively involved as Brian has been advocating for our school district in these situations because if we don't advocate, we don't get the tax money necessarily. Hoffman Estates wants to put real, retail, uh, retail stores on the Hoffman Estates side of 59 across from Target and homes on the Barrington side in the back. So guess who gets more tax money? not us. So we need to pay attention to these things, and Ameritech is a similar situation, the Ameritech campus. We don't know where it's at because they're still working on it and coming up with their plans, but we need to pay attention and be deeply involved to protect our community because we don't have money to build a new school right at this moment, and if that many students come, that's probably the correct answer. So we're going to have to wait and see and pay attention, and as a board member, I would participate in that as well. Anyone else? All right, thank you guys. The next question is gonna start with Eva and then go to Leah. In your view as a school board member, what is the role of community opinion when you're casting your vote at a board of education meeting should you become a school board member? I think we as board members are advocates for our parents as much as we are able to be able to accommodate what they are looking for from the school district, but we also have to be responsible to the district itself more than just to the parents, so I think that um, with with all good intentions, we would definitely want to listen to and adhere to as closely as we possibly can anything that can help our parents um, and our students. Thank you for that question. Um, as a board member, it's going to be it would be my job to listen to the community and get your input, do the homework, find out what the issues are and then come to a good decision. It's not necessarily about what I think is the best, it's what our community thinks is the best, as Angela said earlier. Um, and so that's what I would do. There's gonna be issues that come up, things that are controversial, but laptop computers, everybody has an opinion, there's knowledge, there's communication. Communication is always gonna be important with the board. Being transparent and having good communication, I believe those are very, very important things that need to continue and can always be improved. Two candidates have either been chosen by the person who asked the question or they've been randomly chosen by the fine people from the President's Council. Um, and again, uh, oh, Lori, are we letting people put a chip in on this one anymore? Okay, so chips are still going um, if you want to answer one that you were not asked. This one has been asked to be directed to Angela and to Matthew, so we'll go in that order. And if this question is not clear, um, and the person who wrote it doesn't mind. If you guys need clarification, maybe the person in the audience can raise their hand if you're not exactly sure what they're asking. Um, so here's, here's the question. 
with regard to votes, presumably on the Board of Education, that are about Illinois-wide issues. Will you vote as a representative of our district's issues, or how will you make this calculus? I'm not 100% sure I know where they're going, so if the person in the audience wants to clarify, I can read it again. Yeah, can you just read it one more time? Sure, so with regard to votes, I'm assuming Board of Education votes, that are about Illinois-wide issues, will you vote as a representative of our district's issues, or how will you make this calculus? I guess if it's maybe touching on something like a gun issue where it's a, a arming, you know, oh. if it's a, maybe if it's a statewide issue, I'm not sure if that's where they're going with that, but okay. it's an issue that would really touch on the whole state. That's where I was definitely going with that. Okay, okay. okay. That's where they're going um, All right, so I'm glad I have a chance to speak on this again. Um, you know, after that vote, uh, Moms Demand Action came to a board meeting and provided an open letter to the Board of Education saying that vote made us scared that you want to arm Barrington teachers. And in the future, this organization asked that if we are confronted again with this resolution or a similar resolution, that we would engage with community members. And absolutely. And, and I think that we did miss an opportunity in not you know, speaking with community members before taking that vote. Um, certainly, I did not intend to increase fear in our community regarding safety and security in our schools. And it makes me so disheartened to think that after all of the work and um, commitment that I put to increasing safety and security is probably one of my top priorities while serving on this Board of Education, that, you know, that was the impression in the community. So. Um, yes, in the future, uh, I, I, if that resolution were to ever come forward again, I would definitely spearhead a discussion with community members to make sure that all of our constituents are feeling well represented and, and proud of the Board of Education and the decisions that we're making. I mean, I think I kind of answered that the first time. I mean, uh, I do not believe guns should be in schools no matter what. I think that opens up, like I said, the Pandora's box of unintended consequences. Um, while I believe that, I think it's also worthwhile to listen to what other things might be happening out there in the state. I do not have, I do not know whatever city or village or whatever brought this issue up. I don't know their particular circumstances. Uh, therefore, I think it's worthy at least listening and engaging to what those are. That may or may not change your mind, uh, but the, the way I look at it is, I do not believe you know guns should be in school, but I'm willing to listen to if someone else believes differently. Anyone else weigh in? Okay. I think as board members, we're responsible to our community uh, foremost, um, to our state second, and so if I'm going to be looking and voting on the board, I would think about our community first and their needs. And then secondly, I would think that we look at the state as a whole, what's good for that um, community as well. Thank you very much. Our next question has been uh, asked to be directed to Leah and to Barry. Would you support sustainability programs such as solar panels, <coughs> food composting, et cetera? And how would you suggest involving students of all ages in environmental and sustainability issues? One of the goals and values of our school district that came up um, with the strategic planning is, um, I'm going to get the acronym wrong, it's H-E-S-S, -S. it's on the website, um, Healthy Environment, and I'm going to miss the S's, I should have written it down, I apologize, I apologize a lot, but they're trying, there's an initiative to be pro-environment and educate our students up and have gardens at each of the schools and have they have recycling now at the school cafeterias, they have metal bins for the three recyclings. Um, we need to step it up a little bit. I've heard from some of our supporters and people that are involved with, um, with, with this that the education piece is a little bit lagging in our schools. So 
I'm completely on board with this and think it's a great initiative. I know my kids are always scolding me when our business isn't environmentally friendly. They're like, why don't we recycle mom? Let's get on this. And I think our students really care. This is our future and it's an opportunity. Um, I, I think that we need to, to support this group. Mindful Waste is a great organization. They're having, um, they're partnering with Smart Farm over by the hospital and there's education programs for every third grader gonna, that are gonna take place there next year so kids learn where their food comes from. And um, they're also gathering the food at the end of the day in the schools and distributing it to food pantries because there's a lot of waste. And the more kids that can get involved with this and family members and learn about this and promote it, the better. Who's next? I think Garrett. Garrett's next. I guess my answer would be yes, yes, yes. I think alternative energy systems are the future. Uh, I think it's ecologically very smart. Uh, I think economically, uh, as uh, um, we, we are losing fossil fuels and, and uh, you know, we're, we're using them up, um, uh, it, it's just the smart, smart thing to do. Uh, teaching kids as young as kindergarten and even preschoolers uh, recycling. My, my wife is a preschool teacher and they recycle at, at the school. Um, and the kids know what to put in which bin. And uh, I just think it's, it's, it's phenomenal, the educational uh, opportunities, the educational possibilities that, that can occur even as young as kindergarten <coughs> and certainly make sure that when we get to middle school and high school that the kids are all on board. Um, encourage the kids to take this information home and, and you know, start recycling programs at home for those families that don't recycle yet. Um, so, uh, you know, recycling the gardens, as was mentioned, there is just so much that can be done and should be done. Uh, and I leave it to the creativity of not only the administration, but the teachers to include that as part of their curriculum, whether it's part of health class, whether it's part of their science class, um, it really could be used in, in, in many different venues, um, and it should be. Anybody else? Okay. Next question. This is a little bit amusing given one of the people that's going to get this question. How would you rate the current school board in terms of quality of education provided to our students, responsible use of taxpayer funds, and adaptation to changing societal needs and concerns? And the person has asked if this go to Angela and Eva. Okay. <laughs> Can you give me the rundown again? Sure. Where, where's sure. your resources? Okay. Yeah. You're rating yourself and your colleagues on quality okay. of education provided to our students, <laughs> responsible use of taxpayer funds, and adaptation to changing societal needs and concerns. Quality of education, taxpayer funds, and adaptation. And that's going to Angela and Eva. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's always room for improvement, obviously. Um, board uh, puts a very high priority on creating um, and approving challenging curriculum uh, that has been vetted by our administrators and is uh, approved and uh, accepted by our teachers. Um, I think that uh, as financial stewards, uh, we have done a great job of maintaining our AAA bond rating. I know that uh, the last time I sat at this table, I promised uh, the large group of people that was here that with every taxpayer that is spent, or with every tax dollar that is spent, I will act as if it is coming directly out of my wallet and approving it accordingly. And I have tried very diligently to make sure that I am a, um, a, a, a respectful financial steward of the taxpayer dollars that come into this district. Uh, with regard to um, adaptation, adaptation to changing societal concerns, um, I feel like we, you know, and this, this just highlights the importance of, of this issue, is that we continue to come back to the social and emotional um, component of District 220 education and the uh, emphasis that we have put as um, not only board members, but as um, you know, the policy of our district and procedures of our district as a whole. I think the board, current board, is um, a good steward for our district, and I think we have a lot of conscientious people on the board looking to our best interests, including myself as a taxpayer, and hope that every time they, they look at spending any money that they were thinking about how it will impact <coughs> their own pockets as 
And so, so I was thinking that with that, um, everybody, ha there's always room for improvement as said before, and I think that um, do people bring in new ideas, new ways of doing things. So I think that we have a good opportunity in the future to be able to um, spend your money wisely and our money wisely and be able to um, give the best opportunities to our students. Thank you. And if anybody else wants to weigh in on this question, I just want to let the candidates know that at 1115, we're going to go to closing statements. We've got about four minutes left. So if you want to weigh in on this question, great. If not, I'll go to the next one. Okay. Next question has been asked to be directed to Barry and to Eva. Um, and the person says, thank you so much for coming. What do you see as the top priorities for our special needs students and specifically what will you do to address the issues that special needs students face? And Barry, you can start. So I thank you, Beth. Thank you for coming. Thank you for asking very uh, insightful questions. I think all the questions have been challenging, but uh, you know they really are getting to the heart of what our our board should be doing. Um, as I said before, the, the whole question about inclusivity is, is just, it's something that we have to be working on. Um, I, I just think it's so important that all the kids feel included in the school and that they're engaged. Um, and we just wanna you know, figure out ways to kind of foster friendships and, and, and uh, include the kids, whether it's uh, attending athletic events or, or um, uh, helping coach teams or helping behind the scenes at, at a drama club or something like that. Um, but I, I think it's important that all the students are comfortable in the whole school. I'm thinking more towards um, Barrington High School where, where everybody's integrated as opposed to you know, kind of some of the separate classrooms in certain elementary schools. But that, that the students are available and, and are allowed to roam the whole school and feel welcome in the whole school and that people recognize each other. So, I mean, I think it's very important that, that again, the board supports the administration that's involved with each other. You know, friends on friends and best buddies and those kinds of things. Um, because I think it's just very important that it's not just the education, but it's the, it's the social, emotional, that um, all these kids need to be uh, uh, feeling a part of the school. Um, I think with the students, I think understanding differences in um, culture, differences, in approaches, differences, and views, um, needs to have more work done with, with teachers looking at and developing ways for kids to understand that certain kids act, act differently or perform differently or not up to, to the, and that's that's okay, that they're okay and that they're just a good person and a meeting of, of a friendship and um, understanding as other students. And so, if they can understand that there are differences, cultural differences, um, differences in, in learning, that, that they can be, bridge those differences and be able to be more culturally inclusive. Anybody else here? Sure, absolutely. I agree with you guys, it's great. Uh, something that I learned this year that I, you know, I would like to share with you guys, the great thing is, Countryside is working on um, a, a playground that'll enable d kids with disabilities to participate on the playground fully and, and have other kids and even ride a zip line. I was kind of blown away. So if you go to their website, look at the playground, you click on it, there's a little video clip. It's an award-winning little short movie about students accepting other students on the playground and it's eye-opening. I was almost crying because I cried too and um, and and so if you watch this little video here's a little boy in a, or a little child who can't do everything sitting back watching and then slowly this child's included and it just warms your heart and it gives you a different view on how these kids everybody wants to be included everybody wants a friend and it's super important for our kids emotions you know I model friendships to my kids but they don't get it they're in their screens a lot there's a lot to be done in this area, and I, I'm supportive of it, and I think we all should be. Thank you. And I'm told that we do have time that is asked to Matthew and then to Leah. What would you do to involve District 220 residents in critical decisions that the board would be faced with? I mean, I, th I think they generally have a pretty good, um, you know, you can come to the meetings, you can ask questions, you can ask questions. There's a lot of community engagement already. Um, I think it's just a matter of building upon that and seeing what works. I, I don't really know what the data is of how many people actually come in, 
you know, how many questions do you get from, from emails? I mean, it's really just about building on what works. If something works, add to it. If it doesn't work, maybe it's not, you know, maybe it's not the venue or the, you know, the, the methodology of which to, uh, to engage the community. So that's how I look at that. Could you just read the question one sure. more time for me? The question was, what would you do to involve the District 220 residents in critical decisions the board would be faced with? I think communication is very important between the board and the community. Um, as we've talked about many times already today, um, I would work on improving that. Personally, I'm very available. I would continue to be available, reachable, call me, ask me, email me. Um, and I think some of the things the board have done in the past are great practices to continue. You know, with this whole Blueprint 220 referendum thing, there's been meetings at every school, information nights, opportunities to watch videos, things online, Facebook Live, um, information meetings. So a deep, deep website. If people wanna engage, there are ways. Um, I know people always come back and say, but I didn't know. But, so it's important, it's important to pay attention and just to ask. So we need to continue this tradition of transparency and openness because our community is, is a smart community and they're paying attention when they are and I love that about our community. So I think this is a great question because it's something that we discuss frequently at the board. We, we feel like we are putting out information and being as inclusive as possible and then we will have people come back and say, we didn't know. And so we are constantly striving to try to increase our communication. I will say that probably one of the best ways to um, increase the communication of the community is to listen. And you know, recently when we had um, discussions concerning switching out laptops to iPads in the high school, um, I received a lot of community feedback. And um, you know, we brought this back to the administrators and, and discussed the concerns that they had. And it definitely brought up um, not just opinions, but also some facts as well discussing issues that uh, you know, iPads have, um, you know, problems with uh, working with Google Docs, which is one of the primary ways of providing uh, information and coursework to our students. So um, you know, that, that is an issue that our board is continuing to wrestle with as far as you know, what we're going to do with our technology next year. And I personally really appreciated all of the outreach from the community and um, try to act accordingly. Would anybody else like to address getting citizens involved in 220, or have we covered everybody that wants to answer that? So, um, we are, so we're gonna work from Angela down, and um, please take about 90 seconds or so, we won't you know, tell you if you run over by a teeny bit, but please, please uh, give us a minute or two of your closing thoughts, thank you. So, when I first considered running for District 220 Board of Education, um, I pulled a quote from the IASB website that said, there's no greater honor for a person of high purpose than to be selected by one's neighbors to guide the education of their children. And, you know, I, I have been so honored to serve on this board, and um, I really consider it a privilege that I have been entrusted by our community to, uh, to do this on behalf of uh, other community members. Um, I think that I uh, bring to the board table um, an ability to be uh, collaborative and respectful. Um, again, I, I do not bring my own personal bias to the table. I try to look at um, data to make decisions. Uh, certainly the opinions and um, thoughts of our administrators, our teachers, our students, our parents, uh, our, our shareholders as a whole, or our stakeholders as a whole. Um, and, you know, I think that the fact that um, I do have uh, experience on the Board of Education is helpful uh, for continuing forward. We are losing two very uh, experienced and um, truly strong advocates for our district and uh, Barrington, to Barrington as a whole. So, um, you know, we're going to feel that uh, as we proceed with the uh, Board of Education. And, you know, luckily we have um, Sandra and Penny who both have experience and then uh, I have the uh, next um, most amount of experience. That's four years serving on the Board of Education. And I would um, truly be honored if you would select me to continue uh, to uh, advocate for our children and our schools. So this is, this is um, a 
big honor to be up here today just speaking and representing a candidate. Um, I believe that we really, really want to keep our schools recognized nationally and uh, locally as excellent. It's very important for our community. Um, I promise to be fiscally responsible with your tax dollars if you would, if you would elect me. I think safety is super important. School stress is really important. And I promise uh, that I will listen, I will try to represent the community, and be there. I'm also really honored that the Daily Herald endorsed me. And uh, it's really important to keep our schools great. If we keep our schools strong, we're going to have a strong community. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, I just kind of want to leave on this note as rest assured, after this process, I really, I mean, Dr. Harris and his team are fantastic. You know, whatever happens, they're really going to be able to take the lead and, and run through. You know, with a with the board, and I think the board priorities today are really, you know, they're they're great. I mean, I believe in everything they're trying to do. Um, we'll see if they can get, do everything uh, financially that they want to do. Um, as a board member, really, our job is to listen, to ask questions try to make data-driven changes, um, and we get one vote to do that. So um, I'd be honored if I can have, uh, have one of those votes and you guys uh, elect me. Uh, on, the other, on, uh, on another note, I think I'm gonna, Angela has been here doing this for four years, nothing against anybody else here. Really, really make sure uh, Angela is uh, on that board. <laughs> She's already been there. So I'm just saying, it's the three of us. Where there's a lot to learn. And uh, <laughs> there's a lot to learn. I, you know, I think it's really a question of a, who, who are the other two people you really want to bring on board to help make those decisions. So. I want to thank everyone. Um, it's been a really learning experience for me, and um, I really appreciate all the uh, people showing up today that have to listen to us and, and try to figure out if we're a good candidate or not. Um, I just want to say that you know, my reason for becoming a candidate is because I feel like giving back to the community is important. I've had two kids who made it through high school and faced all of their challenges and all their successes, and I'm super proud of them. And so I wanted to be able to give back to this community and be able to support you in any way possible as a board member. And I wanna thank everyone. I know we have a really great board right now, and I think that going forward, I'm sure everyone will put forward a, a super effort to be able to advocate on your behalf. Thank you. I want to thank the PTO for organizing this. This is really a, a great opportunity for us to, to talk to you. And I want to thank all of you interested uh, parents for coming out uh, because this is going to be an important decision. Not only the referendum, which is very important, but also you know, choosing somebody to represent you on the board for the next four years at least. Um, I think we've got some great candidates here. And um, you know, I certainly am asking for your vote for me uh, I'm honored to be a candidate. I'd be honored to serve if, if you choose to vote for me. Um, these last three or four months have been a very much like I would call a listening tour. I've gotten lots of phone calls, lots of emails, and it's been very eye-opening that people have opinions about their school. And I think it's great you have opinions about your school because we all want good schools. That is the bottom line. For me, inclusivity, making sure that all the kids feel like they're included and they're loved and they're, and they're, they're, they're part of a, a, a bigger group, um, and stress reduction. Um, safe schools are so important. Um, and uh, trying to lower the toxic stress that all these kids have. So I would like to continue the educational quality. I would like to have financial diligence. Watch your pocketbook. I really think that's very important. I think we all will try to do that. Um, and again, my, my, my heart is in this. I want to give back to the community. I'm passionate about public education. And I think this is my time now to step up. And I would love your vote. I also want to thank the Daily Herald for endorsing me also. Um, it, it means a lot to me that you know they've uh, assessed and uh, they think all the candidates are great, but they said, well, Truler deserves your vote. So I love it if you'd listen to them. <laughs> Well, we really want to thank all the candidates for giving so much of their time. And you know,
to work so many hours for no pay and take a lot of flack all the time. And <laughs> it's not an easy job, and, and we're really appreciative that any of these five is, is willing to serve, and they all are. Thank you, all of you, for coming out. It's a lot of time out of your day. Huge thank you to the President and Council. They put a ton of work into this, and I'm, I'm totally impressed. I'm just standing up here being a mouthpiece, but they did all the work. So thank you, President and Council. As you know, the turnout is likely to be low for this particular election season. That's the prediction anyway. And this is such a big deal, as we all know, you, or you wouldn't be here. So really drag your friends and neighbors to the polls um, so these people can feel like they at least, you know, had people thinking about it and, and getting out there and choosing. Um, so thank you all. And we'll ask the candidates to stick around for a minute after.